Good morning, family. How are you guys doing this morning? Good? Yeah, it's good to be with you. Hey, as Pastor Joel said, I'm Andy Andrew, and I'm just part of the team here, and I'm so excited to be here with you on New Year's Eve during worship. Um, I just sensed that as we were singing, we say, yes, Lord, do what you want to do. I sensed that the Lord was saying that his power is present to heal. And I would love to pray for a couple of groups of people just where you're sitting right now. Um, I just sensed that the Lord wants to heal cancer right now. If you have cancer in your body or there's a diagnosis of someone that you know that has cancer, I sense that the Lord wants to heal that, that he wants you to step into the new year. We're believing for a miracle. I sense that people that have chronic migraines, if that's you in this house, that we would love to pray for for you if you have chronic migraines. The Lord would love to heal you of those chronic mig migraines. And I sense that there was spinal issues as well that maybe causes hips to go out of alignment that the Lord would love to heal. The, and if you have anything else where you're like, well, I don't have any of those, so she's not talking to me. No, the Lord would love to heal you always. <laughs> So if you're in the room and you have one of those things, I'm gonna ask you, or you wanna stand in the gap for someone that you know that has one of those things, would you be so bold as to raise your hand right now? Okay, if you're next to somebody with their hand raised, if they will allow you to, can you put your hand on their shoulder? Because my prayers are nothing special. <laughs> we all have the authority and the power to pray. So go ahead and lay hands on people that are around you. And I want you to begin to just pray. Go ahead and pray and release his healing as you pray. Pray with the size of faith that you have. Even the size of a mustard seed of faith will bring healing that can move a mountain. So begin to pray. Holy Spirit, we release your healing. Holy Spirit, thank you for telling us that your power is present to heal. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is alive and at work within us even as we speak, as we lay hands on the sick as we stand in place and intercede for the sick. Right now, we command cancer and all its cells and all its forms to be bound right now in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over cancer in Jesus' name, that those cells that are in the blood would actually be run through with the blood of Jesus. We command chronic migraines to go now in Jesus' name. We command back issues that bring hip issues and alignment issues to come into to alignment according to the way that God has created our bodies to move and form. So we thank you, God. Any other infirmity that is in this place, would you heal people right now in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ? Amen. 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 Who? Um. <laughs> Before we get into the word today, I'm going to pray over the word in a moment. We're going to jump into it. But a couple of years ago now, I can't believe it's been almost two years that our family has been here. And I can't believe that this is our home. I'm so honored to call this place home. I love Pastor Josh and Lisa, how they lead with such integrity and authenticity. And maybe you are one of those people that came for the first time on Christmas Day, maybe at one of our campuses, or maybe here at Mount Pleasant, and you're wondering, okay, I don't just wanna come to church. What do I do? How do I dive in? All I know is that's what our family did. Right when we got here, we refused to sit back. We were all in. We're like, whatever it takes, we wanna build this house. We wanna find out more. So I wanted to let you know that at all of our campuses next week, Week, we are starting next steps. So if you're going, how do I fit in here? How can I be part of the dream team? How can I serve? How do my giftings fit in here? What does it look like to be family in a church? If that is a new concept to you, we would love to have you join us for next steps next week. All right. Sound good? <laughs> all right. Well, let me pray for the word. Oh, I love you, God. <laughs> I just thank you that you stand at the door and you knock on our hearts. There is always more. There is more of you. There is more to know. You are such a mystery, yet you reveal yourself to us. So I pray this morning in any areas where we are bound, where we don't hear, where we can't see properly, Lord, would you open our ears and open our eyes? Would we open our hearts? May they be soft and tender for you to speak to us. Have your way in this house this morning. I surrender myself, and I ask that your spirit would lead me in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, if you are taking notes or if you're following along on the app, because the notes are in there as well, 
This message is called, It's Time to Wake Up. It's time to wake up. (laughs) I know we get confused in these days between Christmas and New Year's. We're like, what day is it? Who am I? What's my name? (laughs) Right? But it's time to wake up. I want to share with you, there's this word that has been burning in my heart since 2020. I remember it was on the eve of 2020, and I sensed the Lord saying that there is an alarm sounding. There's an alarm sounding. Don't hit snooze. It's time to wake up. And I want to say to the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the parts of us that are asleep at the wheel of our faith, the parts of us that maybe have stepped back, awake, oh sleeper. It is time to wake up. Don't hit snooze because there is a war going on in the spirit. There is a war going on in the flesh. There is an election year upon us, and we all need to be Christians. Hello. I could just, you liked that one. Okay, cool. We'll just pause. Think about it. Remember, I'm going to call you out. I'll be like, you ain't being a Christian right now. (laughs) But believers need to be wide awake, ready with extra oil, walking in freedom, ready to set others free. I sense that the Lord is letting us know that he needs us awake with our eyes fixed, free, and on fire for him, and combat ready. Hello? Combat ready in the spirit, that we need to be ready to the war that is going on around us. And it's hard to be combat ready when we are unknowingly bound or asleep at the wheel of our faith. You know, uh, my dad tells this story. My father served in the Navy. He was a gunner on a riverboat in Vietnam. And he told us kids that he loved boot camp. I was like, that's weird. He's like, no, I loved boot camp. I loved that I knew that there was a system. I loved that I knew that there was structure and training. He liked waking up in the morning. He liked fixing the corners on his bed. He liked being yelled at and told to fall in line because he knew that there was comfort in that. I started thinking about what boot camp is for us. I mean, boot camp for us is our quiet times, those regular rhythms, reading the word. That is our boot camp. But then my dad told us that when he left boot camp and flew over combat and then was placed on that riverboat and was a gunner on a riverboat and saw combat every single day that he realized he was wide awake to the actual war that was going on around him. I mean, I think we have pictures. Did you show, did you see the pictures of him? You did? I don't know because I didn't look. (laughs) But I was thinking about us. And I think sometimes we like the regular rhythms, but then when war hits, when we find ourselves in the middle of something that is difficult, we are wide awake to what's actually going on around us. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you awake or are you taking a break? Are you hitting snooze, ignoring the alarm that has been sounding and sounding and is saying, America, will you wake up to your faith? Stop being the lukewarm church and lean in to all that I have for you. Are you making room for God to move? Are you prepared for anything? Do you have extra oil so that your lamp will not go out? Are we taking time in the light of his word to search our hearts and grow in intimacy with him? It says this in Ephesians 5, 13 through 21. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery. Has anyone ever wondered, what is debauchery? Well, there you go. Now we know. (laughs) But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I want to see you all singing to each other as we walk out, opening your Bibles and reading psalms. No, just kidding. (laughs) making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in reverence to Christ. Awake, O sleeper. 
You know, Ephesians 5 in context is pretty powerful. The whole of Ephesians 5 goes through a progression. It's the Christ-like life, then the corrupt life, the confused life, the cleansed life, and then the consecrated life. And these verses that I just read to you in context of that full chapter are talking about awakening from our sin to turn and live a consecrated, laid down life. To awaken, repent, and truly live. We know that when there is sin in our life, which we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including this lady standing up here, we all have. But when the light shines on it, that's when the enemy has no power anymore because it's not in the darkness. That's why some of us, we're hiding our sin. We're hiding things away because shame tells us to. But Jesus is saying, no, come into the light. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead and live fully alive. Amen? And it sounds terrifying, but you know what's more terrifying is continually living in the dark, asleep to your life. The Lord wants us awakened. And the Hebrew word in in this means to get up, to rise and get up. So where do we need to rise and get up in our lives? When you were growing up, or maybe with your own children, what what kind of sleepers are they and how do you wake them up? I mean, do you walk into your kids and just give them like a gentle nudge and a whisper, it's time to wake up, and they're like, oh, yes, I'm awake, and they come down for breakfast and do everything you ask them to do. Is that the sort of child that you have, or do you have like a special song? Or did your parents have a special song for you because you slept so hard, like, good morning, good morning. Did you have one of those? Like, and is that what you do to your kids? They're like, please stop. You're like, you're welcome. Or maybe it's pots and pans. Like you, you can't wake up. You can't wake up your kids. People are coming in with the pots and pans. They're singing the song. They're doing all the things. Or maybe it's multiple alarms. Does anybody remember actual alarms from when we were young and how terrifying they are? Wah, 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 wah. Like to wake up to that, that's so terrifying. <laughs> how many alarms does it take? You know, this is my prayer for us as God's people. That all it takes is a gentle nudge. That he doesn't have to come in with a song. He doesn't have to come in with pots and pans. He doesn't have to set multiple alarms all around us. And we're like, "Mm, who cares? I'll do it later. I'll take care of it later. I'll awaken later. I'll lean in later. I'll go deeper later. I'll be a real Christian later. No, now is the time to awaken. It is time to wake up. So here's my prayer in 2024 for us as a body of Christ that we will wake up and fix our eyes, that we will wake up and live free, that we will wake up and fan the flame. So I pray that we will wake up and fix our eyes. You know, I was recently leading a retreat at Church Creek, and can we, I'm just so grateful for the retreat at Church Creek and everything that you all invest into that too, but I was recently co-leading a retreat at Church Creek with the amazing Rebecca Lindsay. Who loves Rebecca Lindsay? I love the Lindsay. I you are. She is so fun to co-lead with. She's like a weapon. I was like, oh girl, like I love Rebecca Lindsay and she challenges my life. I love you and I honor you and I thank you for the way that you lead and love. You have grown me over the last couple of months just doing life with you. Oh, stupid. I was going to try not to cry today. If you're new or visiting, I usually cry. Um, (laughs) Um, And as we were leading this retreat one morning, I just sensed this gentle nudge from the Lord. Come out. Come out on the dock with me. Walk with me. And so what did I do? I was like, okay, Lord, I will. I grabbed my phone. Anyone else? This attachment to our lives, it must come with us even when we spend time with Jesus as if we need to check something while we're with him. And I felt this kind of gentle rebuke, like, leave that here. And I was like, but Lord, if there's like a beautiful picture of like a bird flying through the air or something, you know, I'm like, like, I need it. I need it because I need to like document my quiet time with you so everyone knows how holy I am. (laughs) And I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, are you being serious right now? Yes, I was. And now I'm not. (laughs) And I set my phone down on the bed and I walked out to the dock and as I was walking, it was not even, I was hardly out even on the the dock and I felt the Lord say to me, fix your eyes. I was like, okay, where am I not fixing my eyes? 
And I just felt the Lord begin to reveal to me all of these areas of my life where I am completely and totally distracted. And he's saying, I want your eyes fixed in 2024. I want your eyes fixed on me, on my word, and only the things I am asking you to do. I was like, okay. So I began to repent and lay some things down. And I think we can all agree that there is so much distraction all around us. But Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 says this, let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. Carefully consider the path for your feet and all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Keep your feet away from evil. You know, there are synonyms for distraction. I just love to dive deep on some of these words because I think we all understand what distraction is. But listen to this. Interference, interruption, diversion, disturbance, confusion. I know many of us feel like as we're trying to follow Jesus and fix our eyes, that confusion comes in. And I would say so much that our phones are a huge part of that. What does your time with Jesus look like when you dedicate moments to read his word? Is your phone with you? Maybe you're reading it on the Bible app, so you're like, excuse me. But I understand what, we're say- what I'm saying here is, how do we live the opposite? The opposite of distraction is focused, eyes fixed, peace, order, and calm. There are so many things in our life that we can say yes yes to, but is it the right yes for you? Is it the thing that you're supposed to be doing? What things do you need to lay down to let go of distraction? I saw this meme online, and it says this, because a lot of times, you know, it says, don't forget to close all the tabs in your head too. But now we have these little devices that have trained us to be distracted all the time. And the Lord is saying, fix your eyes. Look at me. Stop being so distracted. Don't forget to close all the tabs in your mind to look at me. Do you ever do that with your toddler where they're like, (laughs) they're like doing a million things. They're not listening to you. Have ever gently grabbed their face and just said, look in my eyes, look in my eyes. And I sense the spirit of God is saying that to some of you. That you're so distracted that he's gently grabbing you by the face and saying, will you just look in my eyes? Will you have your eyes fixed on me? Because what I have learned is that distraction quickly turns into apathy in our faith. And apathy, I mean, the synonyms for apathy, guess what they are? Indifference, insensitivity, lethargy. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. You'll read a word and know that you need to be obedient to it. But once you get distracted and you're not obedient right away, then apathy sets in. Hello? And we step away from us like, I can't hear God. I'm not getting any revelation of the word. Well, it is because we are distracted by everything else instead of fixing our eyes on him. You know, I, (laughs) you know, the opposite of apathy, guess what it is? It is passion and interest and feeling and care and concern and warmth and sensitivity. You know, years ago, I don't think my kids loved it, but I just kind of went hardcore with the phones. I remember giving them not very much time for screen time. They're like, well, everybody else's mom. I was like, well, lucky for them. I'm not their mom, but I'm your mom. And then we would sit at the table and I I would go out to eat places and see, sorry, I'm not, I'm literally not judging anyone. I'm just telling you what we do. Well, maybe I did judge people a little, but, um, but I was like, I want to have kids who know how to look someone in the eyes and have a conversation. And so even if your kids hate it, guess what? It's your job to be their parent, not their friend. So I told my kids, I was like, I don't care if you hate me because I'm going to teach you to raise up and have a conversation with another adult. So there are no phones at our tables. They can't even be in your pocket. When we go out to eat, if you pull out a phone at the table, you know the death stare comes not just from me anymore, but everybody else because we are there to commune with one another, to have care and concern, empathy, to see one another. Maybe it's time to get a flip phone and then people will think you're in the CIA. So that's really cool. So how do we fight against this? Well, let me just read you one scripture because I'm gonna get to the other points today too. Philippians 4, six through seven, I love this. The spiritual disciplines will actually save you. We're looking for like, no, it's just like, give me five steps. Read your Bible, pray, throw your phone in the river. I don't, like, seriously. (laughs) 
Jesus is actually the answer. Jesus is actually the answer. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6 through 7, don't worry about anything. Oh, that's so funny. We're all worried about everything. This is scripture. This is truth. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. <laughs> Imagine you actually did that. Imagine we actually did that. Worry came up. Oh, no, nope, not going to worry. Going to actually take it to God. Going to pray about it. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So go to him with what you need, with gratitude for all that he's already done because it reminds your spirit how good he is and what he can do again. Then you'll experience God's peace. We all want some peace, don't we? We all can experience his peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Amen? So fix your eyes, do whatever it takes. So what do you need to do to simplify and remove distraction? Maybe for some of you, you need to go out to the bookstore and buy a paper Bible. And when you spend time with Jesus, you put your phone in a different room. You're like, but what if I have to write something down to do? What if I need to check something? Do you know that when we were kids, anyone remember this? We were fine without them. <laughs> People will be okay. <laughs> and you can get back to them later. So if you need something, get a piece of paper and write down your to-do list that keeps coming out of your head and write it on a letter or write it on a letter, send it to the Lord, write it on a piece of paper and then put it in your phone later in your to-do list, but remove distraction from your life. Amen. All right. Number two is this wake up. My prayer is that we would wake up and live free actually live free. Part of the thing that breaks my heart the most as I travel around the world is watching believers who are in bondage, who believe that they're totally free. Knowingly, unknowingly. I mean, things like addiction and anger and control, lies that we hold on to, shame and oppression, that we're like, it's fine, I'm fine. You're not fine. You need to run to the front, have someone lay hands on you and pray for you. And who cares if you're like, woo, like something happens. Bring it into the light. We need to confess. We need to bring those things out into the light. How many of you have heard the line, and the truth will set you free? We've seen it on platforms. We have heard that scripture or a tiny part of that scripture preached and said and in movies, usually out of context. The point is Jesus was speaking to a Jewish audience when he spoke this scripture. I mean, he has just publicly, publicly forgiven the adulterous woman. He has declared that he's the light of the world. He has predicted his death and declared to the Jew Jewish audience who were listening who he really was, that he was the Messiah. And it said that some believed. Now listen to what he says to them. John 8, 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth alone will not set you free because when you come to terms with the truth about the adultery in your marriage, when you come to terms with the truth of the pain of your past, when you accept the issues and the truth of what your life looks like, that doesn't set you free. It is abiding. It is believing in Jesus to those who believed in Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. There is no five-step plan. It is Jesus Christ in his blood and his death and his resurrection. You have to believe in that. But then... You can't just believe, you have to abide. You have to abide in his word. Think about a pregnant woman. That baby is abiding in her. We're thinking, well, I read my one scripture, I abided. Kind of, maybe, a little. Abiding means there is no separation. You are in him and he is in you. Abiding is different than just having your quiet time. Abiding is getting the truth in you in a way that you never have before. Because when you abide, what does it say then? It says, then you will know the truth. You know it. Because guess what? When we don't know the truth, there are many things that sound so right, feel so wrong. Or maybe there are things you're like, well, that feels right. I feel like Jesus would feel that way. Stop talking about feelings and read the truth. What does Jesus actually say? Because it's pretty confronting. We have to die every day and abide in him so that we can truly live in his resurrection power. But that, when we abide, then we will know the truth. And that is the truth that sets you free. Amen? Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
Okay, there's many more things I have to say in that, in that point, but I will not. <laughs> because I actually want to get to the whole thing. I want to read to you Galatians 5, though. Galatians 5, 1, we've heard this. And this is contextually Galatians. Again, you have to understand that all of these people had just been saved. Gentiles had been saved and the Judaizers had come in and said, hey, you have to live by the law to be saved. You have to get circumcised and do all these things. And the apostle Paul's like, "Mm -mm -mm. listen, these guys are liars and let me tell you the truth. So that's the context. But he says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand Firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Do not let the lies come in. Do not let the shame come in. Do not let the shackles come onto you when you've already been delivered and set free by Jesus Christ. In the CSB, it says, for freedom Christ set us free. And then it says, stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Isn't that interesting? We are submitting to something. Are we submitted to Christ? Are we submitted to our job? Are we submitted to the things of this world? Or are we submitted to the freedom that he has come to give us? Amen? All right. I need to move on. Hmm. Don't submit to a false gospel. Don't submit again to a false gospel. A gospel by which we submit to a yoke of slavery works doing enough to try to be good. Or we, when, or maybe even creating God in our own image, we're really good at that. Creating God in our own image or the lies that hold us captive. Listen, we are only justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The last one that I want to share with you this morning, just go read the whole of Galatians. There's so much that I want to say there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but go read it. <laughs> hmm is that we need to wake up and we need to fan the flame. Wake up and fan the flame. Do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember how on fire for Jesus you were? Do you remember that you would tell everybody about him? And then a year or two sets in and the Lord starts digging around the roots of your life and the issues in your heart. And you're like, this is really hard, like following Jesus and submitting my life to him. This is painful. I don't like the disciplines. I don't like that I, oh. Anyone? And the flame slowly becomes an ember. I'm gonna show you a little video. We had this sisterhood night when uh, I was, just watch this. This is my daughter. And, uh, <laughs> It was a sisterhood night. She dressed up in her best dress, ran to the front. And that's embarrassing to some of us. I couldn't worship like that, but this girl's like, I'm just warming up. Listen to the words. She just, it warms up, it gets bigger. Set a fire down in my soul. Listen, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. <laughs> I love it. Isn't it so good? This is my prayer for us this year that we'll be like, I feel like I have a little flame. I need to rev it up. Maybe you're in your house and you're like, I don't usually do this. What's happening? I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Do you know how does the flame, if it's an ember, what do we do? We blow oxygen on it. We need the wind of the Holy Spirit. We need his oxygen so that we are not the lukewarm church. Listen to what C.S. Lewis said. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Oh, that we would wake up and fan the flame, that we would not be the lukewarm church. And I want to read to you out of Revelation. Because yes, this was actually written to the church of Laodicea at a time where they needed to be reminded, do not hold back, do not be lukewarm, but step in. And I sense that even today, the Lord speaks to our hearts. Any lukewarm that is in your hearts, hear the word of the Lord. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. 
So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Anyone wake up in the morning, you're like, you know, my goal today is to be lukewarm and be vomited out of the mouth of God. No, that's not what we want. But we have to examine any lukewarm in our heart and go, God, where is it? For you say, I am rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed in your shameful nakedness and not be exposed. An ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. That's what a good father does. So be zealous and repent. We have to be zealous to be like, I don't want this anymore. I don't want to live like this. I repent. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul. See, I stand at the door and I knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. (laughs) Y'all are probably going to think I'm crazy, but this morning at 4.30 in the morning, I woke up to this sound. I woke up to knocking and I thought one of my kids was at the door. So I sat up and no one was there. Now, whether it was in a dream, whether it was the spirit of God, I don't know. But what I know is I woke up to knocking at 430 in the morning. And then I heard this scripture, see, I stand at the door and knock. And I sense that the Lord is saying to us as his people, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. And I ask you, church, to fix your eyes. I ask you to do whatever it takes to live free. I ask you to fan the flame. Step into more. There is more. We don't want to live apathetic lives, but we get there because we're distracted. And then we become apathetic to what God is asking us to do. I'll finish on this. My younger brother actually wrote a book recently called Way of the Victorious. And it says this, in every single one of us, there is a desire to have something worth dying for so that we can truly live. It's what we're all searching for. What if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that every, with everything in you that the hope that you have in Christ was worth laying it all down for, including your own life? This is what freedom looks like. It looks like a Christian soldier with a mind of steel and a heart of flesh, unattached to the things of this world that push and pull on him in every direction, truthful in the face of catastrophe, loving in the face of humiliation, full of hope amidst a hopeless situation, holy and set apart in a world of shattered morality. Every single one of us, there's a desire to have something worth dying for deep within us. We don't wake up apathetic. We get there, but we can wake up today, church. What do you need to wake up to? Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He invites you into more. There is always more. He stands at the door. So what is God saying to you, church? What's he saying to you on this New Year's Eve? And what are you actually going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Because God is awakening the sleepers all around us. Maybe today you need to go to the cross. And there are some things that you need to repent of. Bring your sin into the light. Awaken from being lukewarm. Repent of being lukewarm. Going, God, sorry, I've been distracted. I haven't had my eyes fixed on you Maybe you need to go to the candles and pray for someone that you're believing is going to wake up. Maybe you need to come to communion and connect with God and remember and thank him for his broken body and his blood that was spilled. And maybe our prayer team is going to be up here. Maybe, just maybe, you need to be anointed. We've got anointing oil up here. Say, please anoint me for this new year. I want my eyes fixed. I want to be wide awake. I want to fan the flame. I need freedom and deliverance and healing. Maybe you need to repent of control and anger and all of these things. Be set free. What is God saying to you? And what are you going to do about it? And I know that there are many of you in this room where you haven't given your life to Jesus, where you're not following him. He is not your Lord. He is not your Savior. I'll tell you what, when you try to be your own savior, we all know it doesn't work. Works will not save you. Being good enough will not save you. Only the blood of Jesus 
makes us clean and whole and heals us. But you have to turn from your way and turn to Jesus. So all over this place, maybe you're in the room and you're going, I'm not following Jesus. Not that you've had a hard week or a hard month, but you're saying, I wanna lay my life down and I wanna follow Jesus in his way, truth, and life. Well, today, this is what I want you to do. Up at the front, I want you to walk down here and say, I wanna give my life to Jesus. You can come and pray with me. I'll be standing right there in our response time as we worship. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, one of us would love to pray for you. Maybe just close your eyes for a moment all over this place. But if that's you and you're going, I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna lay it all down. Right where you are, I'm not gonna count to three. I'm just gonna ask you to boldly raise your hand and say, I wanna follow Jesus. I'm not following him. I wanna give my life to him all over this place. All right. Now, if you raise your hand in our time of response, I wanna encourage you to come down and pray with us. But right now, I'm gonna pray over you, Father. We love you. Thank you for being so patient with us. I know this morning you're standing at the door and knocking on our hearts saying, would you come in? There is more. Would you repent of your lukewarmness? Would you repent of being distracted? Would you repent of walking in bondage? Would you repent of not fanning the flame? Lord, we want to be on fire for you. And I pray that we would be a church that is wide and awake because that is a threat to the kingdom of darkness and you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So may we rise up arm in arm and be an army that lays it all down for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond together.